Good morning, good morning, good morning, Frederick Gunn School. I'm Mr. Drew, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and your history teacher. So, I'm here because we have a very special guest, Atoje Abbott, class of 2004 of the Gunnery. Uh, he's going to bless us with his presence, and we're going to talk a little bit about media today. So, welcome to the stage, Mr. Atoje Abbott. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Um, it's very exciting to be, to be back here, especially with TPAC. Um, mm -hmm. I remember EPAC, and now we add a few letters, but we're here, and um, it's it's stunning to see this room, the space, the building, and it's really remarkable, and I'm very proud to be here with something to say. So tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could go very far back, but uh, I'm... Specifically, <laughs> let's start with the gunner. Okay, there we tell, go. Tell me more about go. what's going on with that and your yeah. experience with it. Um, I was born and raised in New York City, went to school in New York, and when I graduated high school in 2003, I had an opportunity to go to the gunnery for school. And with that, I was able to come here as a postgraduate, and it was the most important thing I've done in my life to this day because I was able to come here to Washington, Connecticut, and one, see how the other half lives, two, be a part of a small community rather than a major metropolitan area, and three, I found my love for the arts here at the gunnery, and that's something that no one could take away from me, and I wear that with pride every single day of my life. Fantastic, so when you say the other side, you want you saw how the other side lived, what, is, what do you mean by that? What is that? Well, I mean, to be specific, I. I grew up with my parents are immigrants from Nigeria. So I grew up in New York City and my sister and I, we came from an African household, but when we go out to the world, our, stu our peers, our students are from different backgrounds, different cultures, and that's what I knew. So to come to the gunnery at that time, my perspective of what the world was, was very much a metropolitan, is very much about all these different cultures blending it to be one thing and that's New Yorkers, which mm -hmm. that's its own type of type of thing. Right. But coming here to the gunnery, I was able to I was able to slow it down a bit. I was able to see the comparisons to me and someone else, not just being New York City. It has to be more to, to compare you to someone else other than New York City. And I was able to see, and I literally mean the other half by, by saying literally the people that could pay a high price to go to a school for secondary school. And I never knew that was important because I thought sports is the only way to get to the next level, so be a college. But having the academic type of um, concentration is important. The art concentration is important. The musical entertainment is important. And I never got to really experience that because it was all about New York City hustle bustle, grind, and sports. Coming here and seeing that there's more to life that you could want rather than what people are telling you it looks to be explored here. What we have here are the uh, rehearsal rooms, right? This is more like the, the big band stuff. Uh, we come on in here. We have all this equipment uh, and a very big instrument collection. Uh, we have a bunch of jazz bands, a bunch of rock bands. Uh, they typically perform periodically throughout the year. Uh, and here we have the recording equipment, uh, the sound check stuff all that all the technical things that i can't figure out right now <laughs> it's okay but you know it's it's just amazing uh you know i, I don't want to say state of the art that sounds cheesy but um it's true it, i mean this is what the investments was yes you were able to experience the arts uh pretty much dive into it here at the gunnery so Tell us more about what that was like and how you stepped into that. Who encouraged you? How'd you get, Yeah. <laughs> like, how'd you dive into the play? Yeah, I, I, I never thought I would be able to do the arts here at the gunnery. I, I was recruited to play basketball here. And then one afternoon I saw a bulletin or they made an announcement, I think, during a school meeting. It's like, and by the way, we're having auditions for the uh, fall play. It's William and just picnic and you can sign up here and, It'll be one evening. And I thought, wow, I always wanted to act. I think I'm a good actor, but not really know what acting is. But I always wanted the opportunity to act. And in New York City, it's hard to get that. They have community theaters, but I didn't come from that. I came from the sports world. So I went to this, this audition one evening after studying. And I auditioned for the play. It was 
myself and another classmate, Tabby. And uh, literally, I went out for the lead role thinking, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. And um, I found out a couple of days later that I, 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 I say book now because I'm in that world, but mm -hmm. I got the lead role to play. And I think if I never experienced that opportunity, knowing that the gunnery gave me that type of validation that you are this leading actor in our world here, in this community. And that from there, I felt like this is something I'm really destined to do. And from there, I had the acting book because I wanted to keep on going and do it more. Right here, we have this big community project, this big community art project that we put together. Basically, uh, as the, you know, the bark, the trunk, all this stuff of the tree are, you know, well wishes and notes, positive notes that oh, wow. teaching faculty wrote. And uh, the leaves are the students with their own signatures and signage. And, you know, because we like the idea of, you know, being the tree that's always growing. And, yeah, but the, the, the record of having the year of what it was too, it's amazing. Right, <laughs> right. We all were a part of it, you yeah. know? Thank you so far for all you've contributed to this conversation because, I mean, it's 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 hard to think outside of our own boxes. Mm -hmm. And like you were a person who had to, right? Literally was in this sports box, this athletic box, right? But you, there were so many opportunities, so many things that you could try while you were here. And you did that. And that's a great way to take advantage of the kind of space that this is. Uh, and we encourage that even to this day. Um, but now, uh, to transition, I am curious as to uh, your credentials as a writer, producer, right? Um, director? And director. Like all these things. Yep. <laughs> um, so I'm actually curious as to what that process has been like uh, as you start to continue moving forward in the world of film and acting. Yeah, it's um, it's been a journey and it's an ongoing one as well. I started in the business in 2008 when I graduated college. Again, being at the gunnery and being able to kind of find my love for the arts was amazing. But then you go to play basketball at Division One, you're traveling places and it's not, you can't, you have to be full into this business. So when I graduated in 08, there was, the economy was going down. And for a lot of people, it was basically, do you wait? I mean, it's kind of hard to talk about it now. Not hard, but it's kind of ironic because right now it's a pandemic. So people who graduate in 2020, their parents are like, get a job. It's like, there's no mm -hmm. jobs out there, right. you know? So right. um, to parallel that, for me in 2008, it was hard to get jobs. And I thought, I had advice from a friend, you have 40 years of your life to work, do what you want to do right now. And for me, it was definitely acting. So I started auditioning for things doing some print modeling, um, hit the ground running, no connections, just trying to find out who I could be. And the best thing as an actor, you get to meet so many different people. You get to meet producers, writers, directors, everyone. And um, I did that. And I was fortunate enough to work on a play called That Championship Season on Broadway in uh, 2011. And you have these great actors, Kiefer Sutherland, Jason Patrick, Brian Cox, Jim Gaffigan, and um, Chris Noth and directed by a Tony Award winner, Gregory Mosher. So this is a world of the arts at a high level. My other, my, my other comparison of theater in my life was at the EPAC, mm. and then my next theater job is on Broadway. You right. know, that, that's, I mean, <laughs> right. I, I, I say it out loud, and I realize that, that doesn't really happen, you know? Mm -hmm. But it happened for me because that, my athletic mindset was always trying to get to that level. And it was a play called That Championship Season. It was about basketball players. They're celebrating their... 20th reunion of a high school championship. And that's my world. And I re reached out to director Gregory Mosier and I became his assistant director on this Broadway production. And it was an amazing opportunity because I felt like, and I carried him the best athlete basketball player in New York City. So anything mm -hmm. about basketball in New York City on any level, Broadway, film, anything, TV, commercials, it's me. I, mm -hmm. I, I did it. I have the history. And this Broadway play, it's a play that doesn't have any black people in it. So clearly it wasn't going to be on stage, right. but... I was able to kind of be the one behind the scenes like I did with your good man, Charlie Brown at EPAC and support the other guys. And from there, it was almost like a masterclass. You know, I, I, I didn't go to, I didn't go to get my MFA at a school to kind of learn the ins and outs about the art world and things like that in theater. I really learned about professionalism, 
true, true, true artistry, true way to direct and write through that play. And um, I wrote a feature film script during the time I was backstage while the guys were performing on stage. And um, I thought it was pretty good. I was very inspired by people like Lena Dunham, inspired by uh, Ed Burns, inspired by Spike Lee's people that make a feature film. Their first one, they write it, they direct it, do all they can. And it's a display of talent. Mm -hmm. But the hard part is, is that you, you can't really, people aren't going to give you money for your first film unless you do a short film. Interesting. So at the time I thought, wait, why not? I mean, I, you, you, got, you guys said this is like, I'm an athlete. You, you literally, if you say make 10 free throws, you make 10 free throws, you'll go to this school. I did that. Now let me go to the school. Mm-hmm. And arts is so different where it's kind of like, some people may like what you did, but other people may not. So I was able to then with my feature film, find out that you have to write a short film. Mm-hmm. So I was really very fortunate enough that I had my producer partner, Ian Phillips. We were able to kind of develop our short film called Jitters. And I wrote the short film. I directed it. I produ- we produced it. And it became something of a calling card to show what I can do. And I always felt that if you like Jitters, the short film, mm-hmm. then you like me. You know, right. it's, it's a hard it's a hard thing because you want to say, oh, well, I acted in this. I did this and did that. But in the end, it's kind of like this is what I can do. Right. And um, we took our short film to a lot of festivals, won some festivals. It was great. It was exciting. And then from there, people will always ask what's next. And then we had an opportunity to make our feature film a New York Christmas wedding. And I was I, I was inclined to do more short films, but. Ian, as a good producer, he is, he kind of pushed me. It's like, you can't get in this hamster wheel of short films. You can't do that because in the end, you make short films for the rest of your life. And right. a feature film is what you want to do because not many people could do that. So um, from there, it was just basically really trying to keep on exploring the art world, but also exploring a world where I'm just trying to do my best one step at a time. I mean, there's been some major hurdles, mm-hmm. but also in those hurdles, I'm still someone as an athlete who wants to do all the research to do it the correct way. Right. So you you mentioned your athleticism as a way that you see your your drive, mm-hmm. right? Your work ethic, right? Are there any other identifiers that you see yourself where you uh, that kind of drive your work? Uh, it could, could be athleticism. It could yeah. be any other particular identifiers. I think I've started to evolve the past couple of years as I created more to identify more in an empathetic way. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew as an athlete at, at the division one level, I was very different than the rest of my teammates. <laughs> I cared about things a certain way. I, um, I was emotional about things a certain way. I didn't let things go. I took things personally, which is great for an actor. Um, so I knew then as we started developing our films that it's really important as an independent filmmaker to do, to do things that people have not seen before, Mm -hmm. because in the end, if they've seen it before, how do you make noise basically? So I was able and fortunate enough as an actor to be cast in the film Stonewall, um, was able to play a true LGBTQ pioneer, Marsha P. Johnson. And from there and my research and studying her and working on that film, I saw things differently in the world, in storytelling. I mean, everything, my view changed on everything because I was an athlete, I'm a guy who's a part of a team, but in the world of Stonewall and being that mental state of 1969 and the mental state of Marsha P. Johnson, I started realizing there's so much more to this world than what I've seen. Mm-hmm. and the more that's in this world is in my backyard in New York City on Christopher Street. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, I just saw, I I saw different ways to kind of see stories in a way that haven't, that I haven't seen before because there are people out there who are brave to tell stories. We've seen, we we know them, you know, but I think from my perspective as a Nigerian American, from immigrant parents and how I see the world, I think in my storytelling, you could see an, there's an earnest type of thing in my storytelling where I'm being very personal in what we're saying, but even how personal it can be, it's still very universal because I see the world because of my parents and because of my friends and because of even the gunnery. I see the world where I'm trying to connect to everyone rather than just to one specific type of person. Mm-hmm. I have a couple more questions. Sure. 
So the first question is just about the the industry as a whole, particularly between uh, two noted, very uh, high profile uh, directors themselves, um, Spike Lee and Tyler Perry. What have they uh, done uh, for the community of black directors and black actors uh, from your perspective? I, I, th I think Spike Lee, he was one of us, basically. You know, right. he was one of us that was creating work that we want to see. He was one of us that's created work that was saying something rather than just trying to get put on, basically. Mm -hmm. And I say that in a way of, for a lot of us black artists, we have we don't have time to mess up or have that third or fourth chance. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I've, I'm experiencing that. And luckily for now, I was able to kind of, and I'm not going to I was able to kind of with one short film and one feature film and have now, I'm a filmmaker that's on Netflix. I was able to kind of lead by the example of a Spike Lee. You know, he's someone who's at a high standard and also his love for things other than just art, you know, right. his love for sports, mm -hmm. for black people Big to see that. <laughs> and, and, and I say black people in a way of everyone, but I'm yeah. saying, but primarily black people because in this world of like, in the film world, entertainment world, we don't, we don't have those leading figures that we're kind of like, you know, Spike Lee is creating what he wants to make, enjoying the life he wants to have. And he's also unapologetic about that. Mm -hmm. Tyler Perry is a filmmaker who you give it up to him, you applaud him, but also you're inspired by him because of what he was able to do on his own. Right. And yes, he has a team of people that have helped him get there, as we all do. But, you know, he acted in this play, he, in his plays, the Medea trilogies, uh, the, trilogy, the Medea series. He did, he directed them, he, he produced them. You know, he did everything because he wanted to make a mark for himself in his business. And to see Tyler Perry do that and now to have his own studio in Atlanta, I mean, I would love to work with Tyler Perry one day. <laughs> but I, I, I think Tyler Perry would definitely be a, understand what we did with our production company, Willful Productions. You know, we, we didn't wait for someone to give us money to say, now make something mm -hmm. or wait for that perfect time 10 years later. We just got, went out and did it with our short film and our feature film. Right. Um, and I think your those works specifically Stonewall and uh, a New York Christmas Wedding. Uh, you really, you know, knowing that you are the, the at least the writer for a New York Christmas Wedding, uh, I really feel that sense of intersectionality mm. with your work, right? Um, because you're in the film, but <laughs> <Yeah>. you're <laughs> you're not like yeah. the person in yeah. the film, right? Yeah. You uh, intentionally set yourself up to be this do yeah, right yeah. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen a new york christmas wedding it's on netflix it's available it's great i almost cried mm. almost um, almost what? almost it almost, almost got me i'm what? like no 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 was it's, that towards the ending or was that it was towards... it was, a, it was at the ending okay. and then rewinding it actually okay. and then yeah. looking at the beginning like yo anyway yeah it's a great film you should check it out <laughs> thank you but um there's a particular scene that i i want us to look at uh as we, as we move forward, um, and it's when Gabby and Jennifer, Jennifer are in the car uh, leaving the priest. Do you want to talk about it? I'm done talking. That's all anyone ever does is talk. How about some action? Jennifer says, "Do you want to talk about it?" And then Gabby says, "I'm done talking. That's all we. That's all. That's all we ever do is talk. How about some action?" That's scary, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because that made me feel like there is so much to do. Yeah, um, there's yeah. a there's a lot that I know that I've said and I've been saying for all the years I've known intersectionality was a word, mm -hmm. but now there's this action piece. There's yeah. this do part, especially with uh, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement the LGBTQ rights movement and how all these things add together. Uh, and women's rights too, at the time too, yeah. Right, yeah. And women's rights. Uh, we're, we're presented with um, a task. And, I'm, and you said, you, you even said like, as you write these things, you're very intentional yeah. and careful on what you say and how you say it with the people you have available to say it. Um, so I'm just curious as to uh, how do you use your work to continue influencing uh, intersectionality. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, especially that specific scene, because it was very important, especially for our Gabby character, 
Jennifer's passive. She's from the world of New York City, uh, Manhattan, and she has this different type of lifestyle where it's very, she's around people who are very uh, affluent and she, she is around that, but she's from the kind of fighting culture that Gabby's from, right? And it's interesting with Gabby growing up in Queens and living in Queens now and Jennifer's in Queens while they do this. And the scene starts off with they talk to the priest about getting married. The priest is saying, I can't marry you. Gabby's saying, but you know, you must marry us. You know, we, we were baptized here, we're confirmed here. I work for you. You have to marry us. And he's like, we can't do it here. Go to another church. And Gabby's like, no, you know, no, we're not going to do that. And I think when I started writing that and I realized this Gabby character is a fighter mm -hmm. and she's a fighter because she's fighting for herself. She's fighting for people before her, fighting people after her. She's also fighting for Jennifer because Jennifer is someone at the time to kind of speak up for herself and Gabby's fighting for them. Um, and there's actually, we referenced that in the script too, when they're having dinner with the father and Jennifer is so happy that, you. you know, life is good now, you know, Poppy should have seen her, like, Gabby, Gabby, really. how she, st how she stood up to it's how she defended hilarious. herself. Mm. Poppy, you should have seen how she was standing up for herself. It was so bad ass. <laughs> I was standing up for us. And Gabby's like, no, I, I was standing up for us. It's not, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Gabby's fighting for something bigger than herself. Right. So, and I think in writing these type of stories or scenes, it's really important that I'm conscious to what's happening clearly that in this world, that there's some people out there who are fighting a fight. I mean, the, the, even me every day in this world as, as an actor, as a black male, I'm fighting a fight. Mm -hmm. I go back to the idea of Marshall P. Johnson stepping out in 69 as a gay drag queen you know, a black person 69 too, in the 60s too, like she's fighting a fight. And I feel as if a lot of people are fighting a fight, but people don't know what fight they're fighting mm -hmm. or, or who they're fighting for. Mm -hmm. And I think for this Gabby character, and I think for what I was trying to say and explore in this film is that we can all celebrate, yeah, this is a Christmas film, there's the LGBTQ content, it's a romantic love story with two sapphic people. But in the end, in the reality, there's people fighting for their love. Mm -hmm. And I think... I want to be conscious of that and what I write and what I put out there because I understand it. And I understand it because of my work on Stonewall and I understand it because of my work on Jitters. Mm -hmm. And it can't be in every story I write, but right now it's very important to me that I'm defending that because I feel as if, as an ally, what am I saying that's important? This is the uh, jurisdiction of our fine arts uh, and uh, sculpting teacher, Andy Richards. We had some really great art done. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, there are some things that were just in the process of, of being finished or in the process of being completed. Oh, <laughs> yeah. This is all happened right before the pandemic. It's like, all right, everyone drop everything and leave. Right. The students really, really dive in into the arts program. It's actually pretty refreshing when you see it. Mm -hmm. That's a painting or that's a still? Photograph. Oh. Just a little digital media. Yeah. I just really want to know uh, before you leave us today is what is black joy to you and how do you experience that? How have you experienced it? How have you experienced it? And how do you experience it? Yeah, I, I, black joy to me is just being able to wake up and be fulfilled in the idea that the day before, the night before, I went to bed giving it my all. and. It's really important to realize and understand that we can't we can't uh, build Rome in a day, you know, and uh, we can't build a film studio in a day as well. But we could also put all our energy and focus into into a, ta a daily task, and hopefully the next day we wake up and say, hopefully we don't regret what we did the day before. I'm an artist. I'm going to keep on growing. I'm going to keep on trying to do what I can do. And I'm going to keep on spreading the word of that. Be an example where literally, if I can do it, you can do it too. Because I've sat in these seats, not these seats, because <laughs> technically this is a T pack with the E pack. But I, I've been, I walked around here and I had dreams. And I'm still trying to do it every single day. And I'm still trying to do the work, go to bed, and wake up with joy. Fantastic. Well, thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you, Toje. Uh, everyone clap it up for Toje Abbott, class of 2004. <laughs>